I'm Joanna Garner. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Educational Partnerships here at Old Dominion University. And we're fortunate to have with us today Joan Thorne, artist whose uh, exhibition Light, Layers and Insight recently opened at the Barry Art Museum. Welcome, Joan. Thank you very much. It's so nice to have you here. And we appreciate you sharing your work with Old Dominion University and our community. Well, thank you, and I'm delighted because it's my first retrospective exhibition in this country. I've had three outside of the country. And so since I was born in this country, it's a, really a, a special treat for me to uh, see this beautiful exhibition and the way it was hung mm -hmm. so beautifully. It's really stunning. Yes. So I have some questions about uh, talking about retrospective, about, about your life and your work. And I wanted to begin with uh, two quotes. Um, one is from Richard Vine, the managing editor of Art in America, and he says, over the years, many competing styles have come and gone in New York and the global art scene. Conceptualism, minimalism, pop, East Village punk, neo-expressionism, and the new figuration, socially engaged relational aesthetics. Yet through it all, Thorne has remained steadfast in her artistic and metaphysical vision. Each atom is mostly space, and the cosmos itself is mostly dark matter. A vacuity, a nothingness, lies at the heart of all being, but impassioned scrutiny of that void can mysteriously ex nihilo yield everything. What an amazing quote about your work. It is amazing. He's an amazing writer, too. Yes. And then I have a quote from ODU's Vittorio Calaisi. He says, while an undergrad graduate at NYU, Joan Thorne saw Jean Cocteau's film Orpheus from 1950. During the narrative, certain characters magically travel from one place to another by passing through the surface of a mirror. This image stayed with Thorne, remaining for her the symbol of a passageway into and through the painting, enabling her to travel into the paintings as if going through the mirror. Inspired by the impermeable glass surface that opens to another world, Thorne imagines her canvas as layers going back in space and coming forward. Another wonderful quote. Yes. <clears throat> so Joan, my, my first question for you is, how did you become an artist? Well, that's um, <clears throat> a very important question because I became an artist, I believe, when I was about four years old and I was looking uh, on the floor. My father was a, a hand surgeon and he had these surgical atlases that were very colorful and he had them on the, on the floor uh, one day and I would love to flip through the pages and look at the various colors, like a stomach cut open or an arm cut open. And I was mesmerized by the beautiful uh, textures and colors of the veins and the organs. And that was my first real visual uh, inspiration. Mm -hmm. And then as a child, even in kindergarten, I made lots of pictures. And at the Little Red Schoolhouse, where I went to school, in elementary school, they, instead of telling me to put them away, they hung them on the walls. And so they would ask me about the pictures and what did I have in mind when I was doing this and this in the picture. And so I thought at a very young age I was doing something important. And so I uh, just kept on doing it because also I was passionate about it at a very young age. And I studied dance at that time. I uh, studied uh, ceramics. And I, uh, uh, Pete Seeger was my music teacher. And so I felt that all the arts were, were wonderful, and I was excited about being involved with them. Mm -hmm. And later on, the dance came, went into my painting. Fascinating. You've persevered with your own path 
and your own style of work. Can you speak to how you've navigated this course and give an example of a time when you had to decide how or whether to proceed with your work? I never had a time when I had to decide whether to proceed with my work. Mm -hmm. I was always driven to make paintings. Mm -hmm. You could put me in a prison cell mm -hmm. and I'd still find a way to make art. It was my way of life. It was my soul, actually. And so, um, uh, fortunately, I didn't have that struggle, but I struggled as an artist. Mm. And I struggled as a female artist because in the 19, early 1970s, I had to give uh, slides of my painting to my male artist friends to show to art dealers because they didn't come down to women's studios. And also I was in two Whitney biannuals, very important shows. The one in the 70s only had three women in it out of all the other males, mm -hmm. male artists. And the one in the 80s had 20 women in it. And so I had to invent myself as a woman artist because I had no role models. When I was in university and college, I had no uh, teachers that were female. And none of them spoke about George O'Keefe or Agnes Martin. And so I'm a total invention. And um, my first one-person show was at the Corcoran in Washington at a very young age. And I also had to deal with success and power. Women are not really brought up to deal with that. And so it was a huge learning curve for me. It's been, my life has been a learning curve, period. Because even now, uh, things are much better for female artists, but they still need to uh, improve. And, um, but now we're in a different place, fortunately. And um, fortunately, my life has been a struggle because you learn from your struggle. Mm. It makes you stronger. It either breaks you or makes you. Mm. And it didn't break me. So here I am. I'm very glad. <laughs> we're all very glad. I'm curious about who or what inspires you to create your paintings. What is your process? And, and could you give an example of how one of the paintings that we have here at the Barry Art Museum came to be? Well, in the beginning, in the 1970s, uh, 1973, there was a big painting, Amphora, and that painting had all the language in it that continued, that I continued to create with up until this day. That's a long time. And this particular painting, uh, I dreamt, because I dreamt I was in Persia, and I was in a palace, and I was talking Persian, which I don't know a word of, but I believe in Carl Jung's wonderful book, his autobiography, he believes in the collective subconscious, that we have memories of ancient cultures, mm -hmm. cultures that came before us in our subconscious. So I felt this is what was happening to me with that dream. Uh, when I woke up, I mean, there was an image of, a huge image of a painting in the dream, and I got up immediately and started to draw it. Mm. And then I made it really large, about eight feet high. And um, it was a, a huge painting drawing. And uh, that was a crucial uh, stepping stone for me. Mm. Um, before then, I, was, uh, I showed paintings of the Corcoran in Washington. I had a one-person show there, and I showed paintings that were 20 feet long, and I just stained raw canvas so that when you looked at them, you barely saw any color. Mm. And I realized at that time that I was painting, after I looked back on that body of work, I realized I was painting this light that you see when you just are born, like this kind of white mm. light. 
and I've always been a painter of color and light, but that those paintings um, were about that moment that I realized later. However, after I did all of those paintings, I went took a trip to to uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. It was the first time I'd ever left the country because I'm a traveler. I've been all over the world now, and I had a catastrophic mystical experience in Chichen Itza and Oshmal, the ancient Mayan ruins, temples. Mm. And it changed my life. So I came back to New York. I changed almost everything in my life, including my painting. And that's when this painting came into being called Amphra, the one that I described to you previously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, Joan, you received the Prix de Rome Fellowship and worked in Siena for several years. Can you talk a little bit about how it felt to receive this accolade and also what you gained from working overseas? Well, I have to say that my advice to artists and young artists, artists of all ages, or people in general, uh, leaving the country to experience another culture, another country, mm -hmm is an amazing learning experience. And for me, I've been to <clears throat> Southeast Asia three times, to Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam. I've been to India twice. I've um, painted in the mountains of the Dominican Republic. I have visited Haiti, all of Europe, so on and so forth. And all of these countries and all of these experiences have influenced my painting. That's why uh, you can see some titles in my paintings. One would be Kajiraho Sun or, um, you know, uh, Ananda. Uh, those are influenced by India. Then some other titles would be Influence of Burma mm. or Influence of Cambodia, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And it's not like I'm literally painting those places. But since I'm an abstract artist, I paint the essence of a place that I've been in, the, in one of those countries. Mm -hmm. And it's very inspirational for me. And, uh, and so I, uh, I also develop my inspiration from nature and from my subconscious. And I'm a very intuitive, mystical painter. So I look at my work as having a mystical essence. And I um, hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. That's great. Even though you travel, you have kept a studio in New York City for many years. How has the city and its art scene changed over the years? And how has this influenced your thinking and your work? <clears throat> I'm mostly influenced in my work by Artists like Van Gogh, mm. Rembrandt, Matisse, um, Vermeer, artists who paint light. I like to go back to, you know, earlier artists, Picasso also, um, because I think we can learn from them as living artists. Uh, of contemporary artists, <clears throat> I've been, um, I've gotten a lot of joy from Mark Rothko's paintings and Pollock's, mm -hmm. uh, de Kooning, Gorky, um, and those artists. I um, was visited by famous art critic Barbara Rose, and she walked into my studio and she put my, my work in Art of the 80s show, which was a famous show at the Gray Gallery. And she told me, she said, oh, you're the only artist I've ever met who understood Pollock. She said most people um, look at Pollock, they understand Pollock somewhat, but they can never use that information in their painting and go beyond it. So I think that's what she meant. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great compliment because mm -hmm. I, I like Pollock a lot. Mm -hmm. 
In the exhibition catalogue, ODU art professor Vic Kalaitzi writes about the painting Siam, which you completed in 2013. And he describes it as having an easy rhythm of cobalt blue mm -hmm. with staccato diagonals that invite the viewer to have a cooperative role in assembling the picture. Can you comment on what he might mean in terms of how you imagine the viewer assembling the painting? and how a viewer might visually come to make sense of it. Yes. Um, that painting was influenced by my trip to Burma. Mm -hmm. And the images in that painting <clears throat> come from my subconscious. Um, there are a couple of images that not only come from my subconscious, but come from things I've seen in the Burmese temples in a wonderful state in Burma called Bagan, mm -hmm. ancient temples, some forms in the painting um, that are circular and have a little tip of a triangle. Um, but the others come from my subconscious completely, and I wanted to just capture the feeling of that area where they have the ancient temples. Mm. And so that produced the, the painting. Mm -hmm. So we're having our conversation at the beginning of 2020, which is the start of a new year and a new decade. And I'm curious, what do you imagine you'll be working on this year and where might the inspiration for this work come from? Well, since <clears throat> I'm an intuitive painter, mm -hmm. And I try to live in the moment. I don't know. When I get an image in my mind, mm -hmm. it usually triggers the beginning of a painting. Mm. Like Blake, like a shaman, like Black Elk speaks. I consider myself a, a form of a shaman because I get these. Um, sometimes it's in a daydream. I'll get an image in my mind and that will enable me to start the painting. I might do some drawings with it. And so I cannot predict what it will be, but I can tell you it will definitely be about color and light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then some people say that there are elements in my painting that have to do with wind, fire, air, very primal elements, mm. and I can see them as well. Mm. So my last question for you is, is what might you say to other artists who are just beginning their careers or who've, who have been challenged to forge a path to success? I would say to um, artists who are just beginning that the most important thing they can do is paint and not think about the art world not think about success because it really interferes with the creative process. And I would say to them, spend a number of years developing your work because that's the most important thing. And unlike other crafts, painting develops as you get older. If you're good, you get better and better. And if you're a composer, like Mozart composed, I think his first piece of uh, music when he was four. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like that with composers, but with painters. I'll give you an example. I saw a knockout show of Cezanne's at the Smithsonian in Washington. Mm -hmm. was his last works. And I walked through that show and said to myself, he couldn't have made these works without developing his craft without being of a certain age mm. to, to learn and to be able to paint those last paintings. And so I believe that artists need to paint what's in their soul. And you can't paint what's in your soul and worry about the art world, the fashion show, or even success. Look at Van Gogh. He painted what was in his soul, and he was buried in the ground for 100 years no one bought his work. His brother was even an art dealer. And someone 
decided to buy some work at, of his at an auction or something, and some dealer, you know, he showed it. But can you imagine, I mean, you go to the Met, and you try to look at a, a Van Gogh exhibition, and there are 40 people in front of you with headphones. I mean, poor Van Gogh would turn over in his grave, but he painted what was in his soul. Mm. That's important. That's terrific advice. Thank you so much, Joan, for visiting with us and for speaking with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you very much. And it's been a delight. The whole experience has been a delight to um, see my exhibition at the museum, at the Berry Art Museum. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It's beautiful work. Thank you. Yeah.